Welcome to Thelma FM's Life Story Podcasts. In this episode, we go behind the stage at the theatre with Jean Bell, knee bottomly. Jean was born in 1933 and was brought up in the Dummy Dykes area of Edinburgh. Here she talks about her part-time work as a dresser and call boy. We begin her stories at the Playhouse in December 1980 with the Lena Zavaroni Christmas show. We hear about getting Hercules the bear up the stairs to the stage, the perils of dressing a well-endowed dancer and a claim to fame in sewing a button. We then go back to the early 1950s and the King's Theatre, the Glyndebourne Opera Company, Nelly the Dresser, the Half Past Eight show and a host of performers, Harry Gordon, Stanley Baxter, Molly Urquhart, Derek DeManio, Hope Jackson, the wonderful conjuring double act of Millicent Cooper and Milton Woodward. They could produce a drink of your choice from a cocktail shaker before your very eyes. And in a wonderful piece of theatre, we learn how Zena Dare lent Jean some elegant white gloves for the carnival ball. Zena Dare made her debut on stage as a performer in London in 1899. Marvellous stuff. We hope you enjoy. Stuart, who's now pantomime mostly at the day, mostly at the Chris, at the Christmas show at the King's Theatre, uh, Lena Zavaroni's Christmas party with Alan Stewart, Chips the dog. He was Bob Carling I think oh, his yes, name. Yes, yes. Uh, Spit the dog. Was Spit the dog. Uh, Spit Sorry, the dog. Chips. I've got Chips here. Spit yeah. the dog. And Hercules the bear with Andy Robbins. Yes, I he was the wrestler. That. So uh, I, I was. I was working at night and Dolly was working in the afternoons and um, he, we had to, one of the one of well one of the jobs I had was to help him bring Hercules up the stairs in time on cue for Lena Zavaroni saying here's Hercules come on Hercule and talking off back to the back stage the side of the stage and we we're still trying to get Hercules up mm. the stair <laughs> she had it supposed to be his birthday party and she had a cake made of fish things and that. Grief. And was he, was, wasn't he a bit alarming? Yeah. Yes, well, no, no, he was a beautiful beast. He, he kept him in a caravan. Oh. There's a side road right down to the back theatre. Mm. It's a strange theatre because there's dressing rooms so far and then there's a stage and then there's dressing rooms up above mm. there so yeah. that the stage is on the level with the road. The, there was a half a dozen girls, beautiful girls, you know, lovely slim girls, dancers. Mm. And a lot of my job was sewing up the pipes and things like that. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. uh, I had to sew up a, a button on your Bob, Bob Carroll's shirt had come off, so that, that was another claim to fame. But, uh, <laughs> the the girls had to have a quick change at the side of the stage. They, they went from a dresses, which just dropped off, into hot pants. Mm. Well, the hot pants were all right, but they had these wee big things on it. Well, one of the dancers was rather well endowed, and she had to have a bra on yeah, underneath. Right. So they would come off the stage, and um, and be standing with this bra for this lady, and she was from Glasgow. <laughs> Gorgeous looking girl, but oh, she was as a Glasgow as you like them. <laughs> and, uh, I'm standing with this bra ready for her, and she shot her hands through and my glasses went off. <laughs> so of course I'm looking at the backstage for the lens. And um, luckily I actually fitted it in for the, the next night. The same thing happened. And the third night, oh, Jean, I was all right. I didn't knock your glasses off. I said, I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> so that was that. And of course the first night the, the stage manager asked me to see the stage when the girls are getting changed. So... Uh, Andy Robbins was all right. He says, all right, right. Oh, and he went away because mm-hmm. they were watching the show. And the other one was uh, Alan Stewart's dresser. He says, could you move, please? The girls are going to get changed. He says, oh, but I'm gay. He says, I don't care if you're very happy. He says, to move. <laughs> it was it was like a laugh there. You know. And Alan Stewart, he was just sort of starting off then, but he's mm. very popular now. Edinburgh pantomime. Think he's what nice. was he like in, in person? Oh, very nice. Mm. Uh, they're, they're all very nice. One of the girls that was a dancer, she she bad. I think they were all uh, at the hotel at the top of walk, um, but she broke. She either damaged her ankle that she couldn't dance. Mm. They just have a, a replacement. They always somebody else is sent from 
London yeah. or whatever, yeah. knows all the routine and get into the rehearsal, which is amazing, you know. Yeah. Even the singers, they get a singer. In, in fact, one of the, the singers, um, Robert Robert Walker, I think his name was, the King's Theatre would get alterations done and they moved the Scottish Opera to the Playhouse for the one oh, season. Right. The stage manager says, do you mind dressing males? I said, no, no, well, I said, I've got three of them. Then. Well, three, I said, I've got four boys in the house. So that was Rigoletto. Rigoletto, Madame Butterfly, Fiddler on the Roof. I dressed the, well, I don't, do you know the story of Fiddler on the Roof? Yeah. The, 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 the girls and the mother. I dressed the girls and the mother and Fiddler on the Roof. And Madame Butterfly addressed her, mm. and um, the chap that did the dirty on the Madame Butterfly, and oh, well, yeah. his, his wife, when he came back to Japan with his wife, that dressed his wife, so that's Madame Butterfly and his wife. And then these two, Rigoletto was this Mr. Walker, a worked with the Glyndebourne Opera Company when I was there. So we were talking about, you know, the, the Glyndebourne Opera Company and all yeah. the folk that were remembered from it. Nelly the dresser, who, she was oh, she was an old lady, but she always dressed the principal singer who was in the first the Glyndebourne Opera Company. And is this the woman you were telling me that looked like Edith Pierre? Oh, aye. Anyway, she's um, Bill McHugh was in the next, he was the, the father in Fiddler on the Roof, he was yeah. in the next... And he came in one day when he came in. I knew this Mr. Walker. Anyway, and the, the other chap who was the Count in Rigoletto, he was the baddie. But he, um, born a Bill McHugh, knocked on the door and he came in. He said, how's it going, Hen? I said, it's fine. I said, but what's, do you know what nationality this other, yeah, other fellow's in? Oh, I couldn't tell you the Eastern Europe or something like that, you know? So I said, well, we're getting by with a wee bit French, a wee bit English and an awful lot of gestures. Yeah. Put a white t-shirt on a pad de macho, macho. I yeah. said, it didn't look, no, no, didn't no. look right. Anyway, we got on all right. It was funny at the end of the night, you know, you had to collect all the whites up. There was all the underwear stuff and that, mm. you know. And then uh, they're all standing at the door. Are you ready, darling? You know, all, all the females, all the rest of it. <laughs> Are you there, darling? And they go, no, just a minute, just a minute. And then I would go out with all the white stuff. <laughs> what should be up? The Zavaronis, that was the first thing we did was order the washing machines and ironing boards and things like that. They, they just didn't have anything like that, you know. Yeah. They, it was the first show that was put on was the Lena Zavaroni show. Lena Zavaroni, it would be for about a couple of weeks, I think. Well, with, with the Glyndebourne, you were more, you were doing more of a callboy role. Yes, you? that was a callboy. Right. And it would be, I mean, would they arrive in trucks and everything, and lorries when they came up to Edinburgh? The oh, all the scenery would, yeah. probably. I should think so, although they have got a place for making scenery. I can't remember where it was. Mm. Actually, might be able to tell you about that in Edinburgh, mm. where they make scenery. He did have a job at one time, but... Committed a faux pas. <laughs> oh, I'd have to think. He was at the, the King's Theatre. Yeah. I said, you should go up and ask Des Collins if he's yeah. got any job here. He would make some extra cash. So we went up and it was Das Rheingold. Big blue sky at the back, the ring of gold in it. And we said, oh, it's really lovely, Jean. She said. One night, they put a chair to stop you going behind this blue cup to get the shadow in. in between the, the you know when there's a long period and in Wagner there's an awful oh, yeah. long period of going so um, anyway I actually had gone up and just put this chair away <laughs> you got a slight shadow oh, Archie Bell oh dear so, anyway, he did he finished his time there and that, but he wasn't asked to go back. Used to the theatre because uh-huh. of your dad being there, uh-huh. but it'd be quite strange you you having you know going back to your job uh-huh. you know, in the bookbinding and and then this theatre. It's quite uh-huh. a glamorous sort of oh, yes, change, uh-huh. isn't it? Glamorous, but I wouldn't have liked to work. Somebody asked me if I wanted to be a dancer. That's because I was quite agile up there, running up and down stairs. But I wouldn't have. Had, they, they all thought, I mean, the, the Empire Orchestra was terrific. It was Gordon Rolfe, was the, not, not Sir Thomas Beecham, <laughs> Gordon Rolfe, but they had, everybody said what a great orchestra they were. And they liked coming to Edinburgh because of the digs, because they were, some of the digs that they went into were the very theatrical digs when they were very good. And folk, like, some folk liked touring and that, but it's, it's all right for the folk that can afford to. I know one of my French husband was the, the, the manager of the Royal Hotel. Uh, concierge, I think they would call him. Anyway, um, she appeared with Morecambe and Wise. Shirley Bassey, she stayed there. She said, oh, she wanted us at this, that and the next thing there, you know. 
the Half Past Eight show and did you ever did you say you worked on that or did you just I, I worked uh, yes I worked as dresser to right. Hope, Hope Jackman Stanley right. Baxter on that because yeah. they were they were appearing with Harry Gordon Harry Gordon was the main he was in the main mm. dressing room because uh, it was it was his show the five past eight show mm. half past eight show five past eight mm. and that was obviously the time it went on I uh, oh the, the, yes and they were usually a, a summer run but two two. Two hours, or so. but they changed. I mean, they changed all scenes every now and again, mm. different different parts. Yeah. The, the Empire was more a variety shrink kind of things that we have there. Oh, we were invited in, in the King's Rhapsody. We were. I was me, treated me mostly like one of the cast, and I right. got an invite to the Carnival Ball. The assembly rooms. I didn't have a dress, an evening dress, so I borrowed an evening dress. And I had mm. it up here and seen a deer. She gave me her long white gloves. Uh And as soon as she went off after the show, Helen, her dresser, I think it was uh, Harry or something, he was Barry Sinclair's dresser, and Tony from the bar, I thought, get a good dance here. He might have been a good ballet dancer, but he couldn't do a a quick step. Anyway, so we went to the Carnival Ball, and it was a very nice evening we had there. Mm -hmm. Um, James Urquhart, who uh, sang with the White Heather Club. Oh, yes. He was in the chorus of Mm -hmm. King's Rhapsody, and he was, well, he asked me to get, when I told him I was at Bookbind, worked in the secretary Mm -hmm. at the Bookbind in place, he said, could you get me a an interlude book for my music. So um, I, I got one of the chaps to make the interlude, got his in, initials in, so that was great. So anyway, he was there, and the boy, I nearly went on as the boy king, because one of the wee boys that played the, the boy king, he, all he did was walk from one side right up to the throne and yeah. sit on the throne. The boy that did it in Glasgow wanted to come to Edinburgh, so he came to Edinburgh every night, but one night he was a wee bit late, and they were threatening to put me on as the boy king, but luckily arrived back in time. Oh, and we, we, we had to, before we went to the assembly rooms, we had to take Barry Sinclair's big Labrador home because <laughs> <laughs> he was going as well. A different world entirely, a theatre, mm. and you can see why people are taking up thinking of theatre. Yeah. But it's, it's a little blooming hand work. This is them here. Millicent Cooper and Clifter Clifford Woodward. A, Billy Crockett knew him. This too, I was asked, asked to go up to the, the Empire. They did a show. Now, he changed wine in this cocktail shaker. All trickery, of course. But the front row of the audience, they got the choice. Which drink do you want? <laughs> the lady, yeah. Millicent here, yeah. she was a real character. The, the, this lot were here at the same time, the Merry Max. Yeah. They, were, they were there at the same time. Mm. And she would be singing away to herself, but she mm. sang like uh, Sally, Sally, crazy Bill. She, she had a voice like that. She dyed her hair purply. She had a pink comb with it, was all purple. It was like uh, well, that gentian violet in her comb, oh, you know, she combed yeah. her hair in that way. Yeah. She had that. Yeah. But the gimmick was that she changed her dress at the side of the stage as quick as he changed the drinks. Mm. Now, Guess who was at the side of the stage? <laughs> and then she'd walk on, pick up the drinks, walk down the, the orchestra, through the orchestra, you know, the steps down the orchestra, and hand them out to the different people who'd requested different drinks. Was their show. So that was their act? That was their act. Just doing the drinks? You'd say, what, different coloured drinks, or they'd just be different types of There were practice? different drinks. Oh, really? They had they had them in the, the, the dressing room. I mean, yeah. they were handing them out, they were asking them which, what we would like and that. Yeah. And yeah. the other lot were really nice too, the, the very and that. They were singers, harmonising. This was, um, I think she was uh, in um, South Pacific. She, South uh, Pacific. she was in uh, Bloody, Bloody Mary. What about him? Oh, Derek de Marnie. Meet Mr Callahan. Oh, I can't remember much about it, really. He was supposed to be a detective and that, so I must have been busy backstage. Probably did the calling and that. So it was a play. Right, yeah. Meet Mr Callahan. It was Derek DeMarney who took yeah. the play. I think he was a detective, so oh, to be. Right. But cast, there were quite a few French-Canadians here. Handy a lot they were. Well, I don't. Right. You had to watch them. 
Oh, definitely. Good. One or two, because I would have turned up when I was going up and down the stairs. Oh, good grief. Yeah. In fact, one of Gordon Rolfe, the conductor, he was a very nice man, a very gentlemanly man. And he was standing with Tommy, the stage doorkeeper at the box. And I think somebody had grabbed me and they had just a flight up and... <laughs> came down the stairs. They, they were, the two of them were killing themselves laughing. They had one or two friends and that, and they came in, you know, the theatrical style of camel oh, yeah. coats just over their shoulders. I thought, oh, a load of posers. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Streetcar Named Desire. There was another chap that's in, uh, he was the husband, and you see him in a lot of films. He's been in Colombo as well. Uh, he's got a foreign name, but he was very nice. Yeah. That was at the King's Theatre. I can't remember much about the other actors and that, but I always remember that man, because mm. he must have, you know... He was really nice, and when I saw him in the in different plays, and I see Muriel. Oh yes, she was the Farum in King's Rhapsody. Marta, it's her. Marta, that was the the King's fancy lady. So was King's Rhapsody? A, you said a chorus, so it must have been a musical. It was a musical. Yeah. Well, Ivor Novello was written. Of course. It. So did you talk with David McCallum much? If you were not much, we were both seventeen. And yeah. No, and and I didn't realise it was one of his first films when he was a. I can't remember much about it, but he had a leather jacket on or something, you know. Were you quite surprised when you saw him starting to be famous? Oh, yes, uh, I, <laughs> was, I was always kidding the boys, and I think, you know, see, if I played my cards right, I could have been Mrs. Kuriaka. His dad was the leading violinist of the oh. orchestra. Anton Dolins. Anton Dolin, uh, that was the festival ballet. I was just standing here, the, the, the Empire Theatre stage, and he was just about that distance we had, and he danced that bolero and oh it was terrific but um, I got him to sign my my um, autograph book he says what will I put call me early mother dear <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he actually wrote it but I couldn't find my, my signature book uh, he, he was I mean there, there was no sign to them at all you know mm. you were just one of the helpers of that that's yeah. right. I mean I mind even dad saying I was you're a Nazi and she really was a nice lady and, and dad was saying to her Black, yeah, hmm. you know. She, and she explained very nicely to him it was to make her t- cheekbones higher. So it's you were a cool boy, but of course you were a girl, but of course cool girl oh, yes. has other <laughs> colour <laughs> Well, it was the time of the Profumo affair. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, Douglas Craig, the, the state manager that, you know, that she could speak all the languages, hmm. uh, he asked me for my wee chitty. Hmm. So I'd written six nights at seven and six. And he said, my God, darling, you are cheap. Because I didn't know anything about Profumo and Call Girls and all the rest of it. I was just putting my wee bit in for being feminist. Because <laughs> mm. uh, you, you, you spoke French, didn't you? So uh, well, that must have been quite handy. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, they had all the Grand Ballet de Marquis de Couva. Mm. That was at the Empire Theatre. Mm. And the seed money there was very nice. He, he lived up in... Uh, uh, Colton, beside the Colton Hill, he says, you know well the Colton Hill. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, he, w- he was very nice. And mm. so, um, he had me saying, uh, you know, 12 minutes you will play, 30 <laughs> minutes please, half an hour. <laughs> you know? So that was that was quite good fun. And a lot of the, the chorus, the ballet, they, they were English as well. They didn't oh. speak French, but well, they commandeered into the chorus there. Yeah. The principles were the important ones, but uh, it was nice. I think some of the French ones had a fancy for the Comment on dit uh, voyage de nostre honeymoon. Uh, <laughs> you come honeymoon with me? <laughs> Not to me, to the girls. We were chatting up the other girls that couldn't speak French. <laughs> oh, goodness. And uh, what's his name? Stanley Baxter. I had a message from Meg Altcott or something. They could they give something to Stanley Baxter. So I was going along the corridor and I met him. He said, oh, merci beaucoup. I said, scenario, merci. Oh, you speak French. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, I mean, Meg Altcott was nice. Scots lady and that she's been in a lot of films. Mm. Georgie, I think she was Georgie's mother in that oh, film with right. Bill Travis. Yeah, I know. I think she was the matron in the Doctor series. Uh Doctor Finlay. Finlay. Yeah. Uh, so there was quite a few folk, you know, mm. that were into that and into television. But anyway, Meg Urquhart, she was beside Hope Jackman. <laughs> she was she was dancing that. So sort of foiled to Harry Gordon, mm. but uh, she danced. She was dancing. She always did her hair so that it came loose. But she came and she sent me out to Bennett's. Bennett's. Yeah. 
These are Suzella Van Allen. Oh, yeah. Top of the wood. Bennett's. They sent me to Bennett's for a, a half bottle of um, vodka, vodka or gin. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, she offered me a glass of orange and whatever it was. And they had a big chair at the side, beside the attendant, where I sat when you were getting the makeup. <sighs> she came in that dress. We could hardly get up. My legs wouldn't walk. Oh, I, 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 I mean, I was only about 16 or that. I, it wasn't they just thorn that she gave me anyway. Some of them would have had a, a wee tipple, would they? Oh, the orchestra, any time, the orchestra, the, if there was a halt and they, you know, they were putting a, a scene on or a, yeah. a bit play yeah. in, but shows, they were next to go to Bennett's. Exit from the orchestra. They just had it all the time. Well, it's amazing that, I mean, two years after the start of the festival, you were there uh-huh. working. Yeah. Did you miss it when you finished? Oh, I missed it. I missed the, the company and that. I mean, yeah. I would have done it for nothing, really. Don't tell me. If you've enjoyed this episode, there are other podcasts under the Life Story title. We also have a Leith Lives channel, the Thelma Tapes and Forgotten Songs from the Broom Cupboard. All these are accessible from our website, www.livingmemory.org.uk. Here you can learn more about our work. You can access all the wonderful photos from our photo archive, over 4,000 images of Edinburgh, and beyond. We also have a Facebook page under Living Memory Association or under Thelma FM. Thanks again for listening.